Okay, so I found the woman I was looking for, the Jane Morning uh, James. Um, I haven't found the YouTube authors that did their videos showing um, the insides of Mormonism and uh, just, you know, their point of view on how you can prove that they're not telling the truth about Mormonism, uh, Mormons that is, how it's uh, um, a religion that practices witchcraft and in uh, Freemasonry. Um, so I'm still looking for it, but uh, I did find the woman, um, and maybe uh, by doing this, someone else has seen the video I'm talking about, and the author, this man and woman that, you know, break this stuff down. And because uh, they were pointing out that the way that they tell it, this woman was just a, um, someone that came into Mormonism uh, after it was already found in um, but as these people were explaining, um, the ones I'm looking for, they were explaining that, in fact, when Joseph Smith was at his in-law's house and his father-in-law would not allow him to have the stones that he found, the gold plates, and in the house, um, he was using his slave girl to translate the plates while she was living in her own little hut away from the, um, Joseph Smith and his in-laws. And that's how he was able to translate it while, you know, he stayed nice and warm with his wife back in uh, their place. Because even his father-in-law said there was something wrong with uh, Joseph Smith. He felt he was dis he was he wasn't being honest and stuff like that. But here's a quick introduction to her. I want to tell you a little bit about Jane Elizabeth Manning James. Jane and her family meaning her brothers and sisters, had all joined the church in a place called Wilton, Connecticut. They went to Buffalo, New York, planning on... Oh, she didn't say it, but um, when you, I'll leave the Wikipedia piece in here. She was actually free. Her and her family were free people living in Connecticut, of all places, right? During the time this was going on. Uh, free people. They didn't have a slave master. They didn't have, you know, slave owners. Could read and could write. And you can hear what, uh, what I mean by she could read and write, is listen to what she writes towards the end of her life. Taking a steamship to Nauvoo, and they were denied passage. Their luggage was accepted, That's but they were not. And in Jane's life story, she says, we started to walk. We walked a distance of over 800 miles. We walked until the soles of our shoe were, shoes were worn out, and you could see the print of our feet in blood in the snow. We knelt in prayer. We asked God, the Eternal Father, to heal our feet. And our feet were healed and our prayers were answered. We went on our way rejoicing, singing, and praising God for His goodness and mercy in healing our feet. She closes her life story, which she intended to be read at her funeral, with the words, My faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ is as strong today, nay, it is if possible stronger than the day I was first baptized. I pay my tithes and offerings. I keep the word of wisdom. I try in my feeble way to set a good example for all. See what I'm saying? She, she can speak well and she can read. Um, so keep the word of wisdom. Check this out. Sylvester. I was looking this up because this was supposed to be her son, Sylvester James. Sylvester, the name means woods or wild, or wild woods. Uh, I know that's just a random fact at, at this point in time, but I just thought that was interesting. Just, just trying to learn more about, you know, her as I was going. Following is the life history of Jane Elizabeth Manning James, as transcribed by Elizabeth J. D. Rowley. When a child, only six years old, I left my home and went to live with a family of white people. Their names were Mr. and Mrs. Joseph. Fitch. They were aged people and quite wealthy. I was raised by their daughter. When about 14 years old, I joined the Presbyterian Church, yet I did not feel satisfied. It seemed to me there was something more that I was looking for. I had belonged to the Presbyterian Church about 18 months, when an elder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who was traveling through our country, preached there. I 
went on a Sunday and was fully convinced that it was the true gospel he presented, and I must embrace it. The following Sunday, I was baptized and confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. One year after I was baptized, I started for Nauvoo with my mother, Eliza Manning, my brothers, Isaac Lewis and Peter, my sister, Sarah Stebbins and Angeline Manning, my brother-in-law, Anthony Stebbins, Lucinda Manning, a sister-in-law, and myself in the fall of 1840. We started from Wilton, Connecticut and traveled by canal to Buffalo, New York. We were to go to Columbus, Ohio before our fares were to be collected, but they insisted on having the money at Buffalo and would not take us further. So we left the boat and started on foot to travel a distance of over 800 miles. We walked until our shoes were worn out and our feet became sore and cracked open and bled until you could see the whole print of our feet with blood on the ground. We stopped and united in prayer to the Lord. We asked God, the Eternal Father, to heal our feet. Our prayers were answered, and our feet were healed forthwith. When we arrived at Peoria, Illinois, the authorities threatened to put us in jail to get our free papers. We didn't know at first what he meant, for we had never been slaves. But he concluded to let us go. So we traveled on. Yeah, that, they didn't know what they were talking about. They had never been slaves. Did you hear that? That's incredible. Living in Connecticut. The whole time. They didn't know not, nothing about no slavery. Joseph placed the chairs around the room, and then he went and brought Sister Emma and Dr. Bernheisel and introduced them to us. And Brother Joseph took a chair and sat down by me and said, You have been the head of this little band, haven't you? I answered, Yes, sir. He then said, God bless you. 
Now I would like you to relate your experiences in your travels. I related to them all I have stated above and a great deal more minutely as many incidents passed from my memory since then. Brother Joseph slapped Dr. Bernheisel on the knee and said, what do you think of that, doctor? Isn't that faith? The doctor said, well, I rather think it is. If it had been me, I fear I should have backed out and returned to my home. Joseph Smith then said, God bless you. You are among friends now, and you will be protected. They sat and talked to us a while gave us words of encouragement and good counsel. We all stayed there in the mansion house one week. And by that time, all but myself had secured homes. Brother Joseph came in every morning to say good morning and see how we were. Well, during our trip, I had lost all my clothes. They were all gone. On the morning that my folks all left to go to work, I looked at myself clothed in the only two pieces I possessed and I sat down and wept. And Brother Joseph came into the room as usual and said, Good morning. What? Not crying? Yes, sir. I said, Folks have all gone, got themselves homes, and I haven't got none. He said, Yes, you have. You have a home right here if you want it. You mustn't cry. We dry up all tears here. Brother Joseph went out and brought Sister Emma in and said, Sister Emma, here's a girl that says she has no home. Haven't you a home for her? Why, yes, if she wants one. He said, she does. And then he left us. Sister Emma said, what can you do? I said, I can wash, iron, cook, do housework. She said, when you are rested, you may do the watching if you would just as soon do that. I said, I'm not tired. Well, she said, you may commence your work in the morning. The next morning, she brought the clothes down in the basement to wash. Among the clothes, I found Brother Joseph's robes. I looked at them and wondered, as I had never seen any before, and I, I pondered over them thought about them so earnestly that the spirit made manifest to me that they pertain to the new name that is given the saints that the world knows not of. I had to pass through Mother Smith's room to get to mine, and she would often stop me and talk to me. She told me all of Brother Joseph's troubles and what he had suffered in publishing the Book of Mormon. One morning, I met Brother Joseph coming out of his mother's room. He said, good morning, and shook hands with me. I went to his mother's room. She said, good morning, bring me that bundle from my bureau and sit down here. I did as she told me. She placed the bundle in my hands and said, handle this and then put it in the top drawer of my bureau and lock it up. After I had done it, she said, sit down. Do you remember that I told you about the Urim and Thummim when I told you about the Book of Mormon? I answered, yes, ma'am. She then told me I had just handled it. You are not permitted to see it, but you have been permitted to handle it. You will live long after I am dead and gone. And, and that part always makes me curious. Why? Why would they randomly select for her to touch these stones? Is there some type of passing of her consent, the native person, to, to these stones? Something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, just think about it. Why do they randomly, or what they seem is random, choose her to be the one they leave in the house, you know what I'm saying, with them? when they got out there it's just it's just interesting like it, it makes you think right you can tell the latter-day saints that you was permitted to handle the urine and thumb sister emma asked me one day if if i would like to be adopted to them as their child i did not answer her she said i will wait a while and let you consider it 
she waited adopted as their child, she huh? Asked me again, and when she did, I told her, no, ma'am, because I did not understand or know what it meant. There was not much work because of the persecutions, and I saw Brother Joseph and asked him if I should go to Burlington and take my sister Angeline with me. He said, yes. 